Guess what, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to exclusive bonus audio content and help this program grow by joining the Lions of Liberty Pride. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. We're on the cusp of either making something happen or just allowing this country to walk itself into a clear and, and, and obvious oligarchy. But it only works if everybody understands the message and it's a message that you don't get attacked for. That's what I think you ought to do if you really want to change the world. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. <laughs> oh man, I am fired up. I really am. I I am not faking that one bit because not only am I excited for the fact that I've achieved the monumentous task of hosting and producing 300 episodes of this flagship podcast here at Lions of Liberty for the past three and a half years, I've been pumping out interviews with great libertarian voices like Ron Paul, like Tom Woods, like Peter Schiff, Jesse the Body Ventura, all sorts of names, uh, at least loosely associated with the liberty movement, maybe in the case of Jesse. But uh, we've really worked hard since that time to put together a really fun and interesting show. And I think we are doing that, and the the response seems to be very positive. Uh, Of course, now we've got some spinoff shows on Wednesday. Brian McWilliams brings you Electric Liberty Land, his weekly look at comedy, culture, and, well, of course, liberty. And, of course, John Odermatt, every Friday, breaking down the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. We've really worked hard to bring you a unique and interesting mix of content here. And I'm so glad and so proud to have you guys as part of the show because you really are a part of it. That's what I that's my goal here. I'm not trying to produce a show for me. I'm trying to produce a show for you guys, for the liberty community, for the little liberty kittens out there that are growing with us into strong liberty lions. Of course, I'm also stoked about our little jingle remix at the top there by the great Dan Smuts. And not only is Dan a, a man of many jingles, uh, he is also a member of the Lions of Liberty Pride, our support group. You can be a patron of the show and help us grow even more in the year ahead. And because of that, he already got to hear the rest of the show that you're about to hear, which is, of course, my much Bollywood conversation between Jason Stapleton and Larry Sharp. We had a great talk about uh, the how to best spread the ideas of Liberty, and that really turned into largely a conversation about the Libertarian Party, uh, the effectiveness of that party, and what people within that party can really do to spread the message. Larry, of course, is very involved in the Libertarian Party, having run for the vice presidential nomination and nearly won it this past year, whereas Jason has been very critical of the party, including, of course, uh, the presidential candidate that they put up last year, uh, Gary Johnson and his buddy, Wild Bill Weld. And before we get to that conversation, I have a couple quick pieces of business to hit on. And one of them is our brand new sponsor. And I'm so excited to be partnering with this great company, Martin Armory, started by Chris Martin. And, you know, Chris was in the business world. He was successful, but he really wanted to start a business that he was really passionate about. And that's why he went out and started Martin Armory, uh, which really is able to get some of the best prices. I mean, absolutely insane prices. You got to go over to martinarmory.com to check them out because what they do is they focus on really the 25 most popular guns on the market at any any given time and are able to just get the, some of the best prices. And now, if you go through us, if you use the special discount code LIONS at checkout, you can get free shipping on anything you purchase at martinarmory.com. And after you're done buying your brand new firearm over at Martin Armory, you're going to want to open another window, open a new tab, and go over to lionsofliberty.store. That is where we sell our merchandise. We have several t-shirt designs as well as our koozies because for a very limited time, we have a huge, huge, huge discount. We're hardly making any profit on this, uh, but we're giving 30% off, and that is only through June 23rd. That's this Friday, June 23rd at midnight. The discount code is LIONS300. And now, my friends, without further ado, I give you... My conversation with Jason Stapleton and Larry Sharp. First up, I've got the host of one of the most successful libertarian podcasts out there. I'm pleased to welcome back the host of the Jason Stapleton program. Of course, it's Jason Stapleton. Jason, are you ready to roar? I'm ready, buddy. 
All right. And second, I've got a former vice presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party, a guy who's been picking up a lot of buzz within the LP and the greater overall liberty movement. And he's joining us today because he got the most votes. Number one, not to take anything away from Jason, but this next guy came in number one in our poll over in our private Facebook group when I asked our fans who they most wanted to hear on this panel. Well, you ask and we deliver to you, Mr. Larry Sharp. Larry, are you ready to roar? As always. All righty. And the two of you were chosen for the show because you've achieved some measure of success in communicating the ideas of liberty. And I think this is the evidence by the fact that both of you were top draft picks in the Liberty Draft. A couple fun shows we did last year. So I know that was a crowning achievement for both of you guys first off. So I considered suicide afterwards thinking I could go no further. I did. <laughs> <laughs> May as well just end it here while you've peaked, right? That's what I thought. Yeah, I considered it. But luckily you didn't, so you're still out there discussing the ideas of liberty. I want to start off by asking each of you to to speak a little bit on your own success in reaching people. And and you've talked before on the show, Jason, about, you know, sort of the the marketing and a lot of the the, what goes behind the success of your show. But what I really want you to speak on is more the success of your actual message, because you're really able to capture people from, I guess, both sides of the aisle, several sides of the aisle, people from various different backgrounds and get them all interested in further discussing the ideas of liberty. So what do you think of been the biggest keys to your success on that front. I appreciate you saying that. Um, my show is full of a lot of bravado. If you, if anybody's listened to it, and so uh, you know, if I've achieved any amount of success, I think it has a lot to do with just how I kind of position myself. So. Uh, the the uh, it's a broad positioning and it started out narrow if you want to know the uh, kind of the mechanics of it is that i started out narrow in order to gain a foothold and that's typically how you want to do it if you're going to gain a, a foothold in a new market is i went out and had a kind of a very narrow very rigid libertarian based platform and i was trying to attract libertarians and and then from there over the last uh, year 18 months or so we've kind of spread that out by uh, adjusting the message now we don't ever adjust the principles behind the message but I do just the way I talk to the audience, and the goal has al- the goal has always been first and foremost to attract people who are not liberty or who are not libertarians, but who have a very liberty liberty persuasion. I guess is the way you would say it. Is uh, they're they're predisposed to the message, but they haven't yet come over and and kind of joined the ranks of those of us that follow the non aggression principle and those of us who who live our lives really trying to reduce or eliminate the government altogether. And uh, and so what I try and do is I I try and explain that message uh, to them using current events. But while not hitting them over the head and and calling them status if they don't agree with me and and really kind of making it a I want it to be I want it to be a positive experience when they walk away whether they agree or disagree I want them to come back and listen because they enjoy what it is that they enjoy what it is that we're doing and hopefully a little by little it'll start to sink in. So you don't think that calling people names like status or just telling them they're stupid or anything like that is is effective? I. Mean, <laughs> I think it's you know what I think it's effective if you're trying to motivate a base. You know, if you want the the real politics of it is if I was going if I was trying to get elected uh, on an on an anarchist platform and I was trying to recruit anarchists then then yeah it, it would probably would because many of them kind of uh, they kind of and this isn't everybody but they do kind of hold that attitude. And and so if I was trying to do that then I would I would go a different way with the show but I I really want the message to spread. I want our numbers to grow. And the best way to do that, I've found, is through this this concept of five principles and kind of viewing the world through the five principles, because everyone can recite them if they listen to the show for any period of time. And anytime we talk about news or economics, we can do it through that that mode. And, uh, And it helps people understand the concepts better. Yeah, and I definitely want to circle back to that idea later, that, that you're not necessarily trying to recruit anarchists, because that's not the same as rejecting anarchists at all. But the fact is, most people that self-identify as anarchists are already going to hold a lot of these ideas. You're not really bringing them into anything new. What you really are trying to do, what all of us are trying to do here, is to bring in new people to this conversation, introduce new people to these ideas. And Larry, much like Jason, you were relatively unknown just a couple of years ago. And now whenever I, I see or hear a conversation, about the future of the liberty movement, the future of liberty in politics, your name comes up. Uh, You've received a lot of praise specifically for the way you communicate the ideas of liberty. So what do you think have been the biggest keys to doing so? 
Well, it's funny. In certain ways, Jason and I are exactly the same. In the, and that is our goal is growth, and our goal is growth from outside the party. I think in those two things, we're right in the money. The difference is I'm much more in the party than he is, so I'm trying to keep the party itself as, as a tool to grow. And I attended – when I started just last year, I was not niche at all. I was very open. I was very emotional, and I still am in many ways. So in that case, I'm very different. I, I'm very much inclusive. I'm about diversity of thought with unity of purpose. At the same time, instead of me looking at you know principles, I actually haven't. I've tried to actually bring the anarchists on board and the radicals on board in a way saying, here are your anarchist ideas, but I try to mainstream them. So I'm the, I'm the guy who says, instead of saying anarchy, as, as you know many of them do, I say voluntary society, which is still anarchy, but it's a, main, it's a more mainstream phrase that will work, that people will understand here. I'm about asking questions before I tell people the answer. I want people to think. I want them to talk. I want conversation. I'm going to teach people. That's important to me also. So I'm trying to get the people who are the most dedicated in the party to be better at what Jason said, not just yelling statist, but instead having conversations because they're our front line, right? They're the ones who are knocking on doors. They're the ones who are doing boothing. They're the ones who are out there tabling. They're doing those things. They're getting signatures. So since they're the front line, I want to make sure they're able to have better conversations, teach and talk, and not worried about who is right and wrong, but worried about how I can bring them in. So that's been my focus. I have a seven-year plan I talk about, and what I've been doing is using my Facebook page and literally traveling the country. I've been to seven conventions so far this year, I'll probably be to two or three more before the year's out. And I spend a lot of time trying to do that. I don't spend that much time on the details of the ideology of the party. I spend more of my time trying to get people to uh, want to be involved in the party, period. I'm hoping that the people who are more of the anarchist side are able to be the teachers within the party, not the, uh, you know, the you're not good enough in the party. I hope they become more the teachers and bring people in to bring them more towards that level. I do think the party has to be pointing towards that always. Let's hone in here on the Libertarian Party itself, because this is one area where you guys definitely diverge. At least you diverge in terms of your your current activity. Uh, I know, yes. Jason, you, you've definitely said you have no interest in being directly involved with the Libertarian Party or, or maybe at some point, but no interest in running for office. You're, you're definitely taking a strictly uh, cultural approach you know, by doing doing the talk show and, and trying to bring new people in in that way. Whereas, Larry, you're kind of doing the opposite, although you are doing a bunch of Facebook videos and that sort of thing. You are focusing very specifically with within the Libertarian Party, on the Libertarian Party as a vehicle for advancing the ideas, not only advancing the ideas, but actually growing a political force out of the political party to hopefully actually enact some change. So why don't we talk about some of the pros and cons? I'll I'll kind of flip things here and go back to Larry first. Why is it that you are specifically taking this path of going through the political party, through the Libertarian Party itself? Why do you see that as the best way for you to promote liberty? Yeah, I think there's there's two reasons why. The first one is the timing is right. That's for sure. The timing right now is right. The the two political parties, the mainstream parties, are a disaster. They're fighting each other. Nothing's being done. It, it's fertile ground. That's the first issue. But the second issue is the one of the reasons why the American people won't even hear us is because many of them believe that all we want is death and destruction. So if we actually were able to show them that even at a local level – That we can govern and govern a way that allows for more freedom and allows people to be freer and the world doesn't end. In fact, there's more prosperity and happier people and less taxation and less government and still happier people. Once we do that, more will come to us. And I think now is time to make that happen. But we can only do that if we actually begin to do things like enact policies, remove policies, lower taxes, remove taxes, end the the war on drugs – Things like that that will make people say, you know what? This is the right answer. I really believe that we are the vanguard. We're the tip of the spear. Right now, we're on the cusp of either making something happen or just allowing this country to walk itself into a clear and and, and obvious oligarchy. I don't want it to happen. I think the Libertarian Party is the best answer for that. When you mentioned the the death and destruction and how libertarians aren't about that, that really does address – 
probably the number one thing you hear from people that really don't understand libertarian ideas at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first thing they'll say is, oh, well, don't you guys just want to tear everything down? Don't you just want to tear down all our systems? And in a sense, it's true. I mean, we want we want to radically change the current systems, but that should not be seen as as what they see it as 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 death and destruction. Really, it should be life and abundance. So how can yes. we, how can we actually go about conveying that that that's what we're talking about? We're not talking about destruction. We're we're talking about really prosperity. Yeah, well, we have to focus on the outcomes, and we often don't do that. Like, there's something I brought up which is very controversial, which I love. I ask libertarians, "Are you guys against universal health care?" And almost always they say yes, and I say, "No, you're not." You're against the mandate. If all of a sudden there was some private answer that could actually create universal health care that would allow doctors and and, pharm- and pharmacies and hospitals to create their own system plus charities to pick up all the rest voluntarily, you wouldn't be against that. It isn't the idea of universal health care you're against. It's the mandate you're against. Many people are not against the actual outcome. Most libertarians, the vast majority, are not against seatbelts. In fact, most of us would wear them if you gave them an option. Many of them are against the law that mandates us to wear. So the goal is speaking about the actual outcomes. We actually want many of the same things. The question is how do we get there? Do we get there through force or do we get there through conversation, through example, through freedom of choice, through freedom of association, through freedom of speech? So if we begin to talk that way, more people begin to come on board. And in your view, you can, you kind of see using the Libertarian Party as a kind of a wedge to get libertarians and people with that L next to their name into local government just to start acclimating people to the idea that, OK, if you get this, elect this libertarian to office, look, he didn't destroy everything. Look, he actually was reasonable. Look, he actually saved you money. Uh, and that you think that will really help just the overall perception of libertarians and enable them to further entrench themselves into government? Is that is that kind of a summary of it? It's already happening. I mean, that's already happening at the local level, city council level, and nonpartisan races. We're already winning across the country. It is happening already. Larry, is that your focus? Is kind of is kind of grassroots winning a winning a, a city council seat um, it, rather than kind of like a national political uh, movement? One hundred percent. I am all about the local level. That's why I'm going around to every single state. I'm talking to people about how to build their local chapters out, how to build their local people out, how to build our ground level infrastructure out. This is the goal. Look, we have to run someone for president in 2020 and 2024. We do. And we do for a very important reason, because the press it will give us. What we didn't do well last year and we must do in the future is the top of our ticket always gets the most press, but has the least chance of victory. The bottom of our ticket gets the least press and has the most chance of victory. We have to get the top of the ticket to promote bottom of the ticket. We do that. We will win at the lower levels. We'll win at state. And before you know it, we'll – the advantage that people don't understand is because of the way the two parties are, if we could just get, say, as an example, four or five state senators, we would control that state assembly because we would be the swing vote for everything. We could begin to pull pork out. We could begin to actually move policies, stop the war on drugs, uh, push to the Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other side. And one state that happened, the next step years from now, my seven-year plan is seven years from now, we do it at the federal level. All of a sudden now we have two or three actual state, uh, actual federal senators, and now all those liberty-minded Democrats and Republicans will join us to have an actual voting block. So I don't want well, – look, it'd be amazing if we won the presidency in 2020. I don't think we're going to in any way, shape, or form. However, we have to push it so that we can win at the lower level, and once they see we can do this, you will see everything become more mainstream. Why, why has the libertarian – I don't mean to hijack your show, Mark. I just I got questions for Larry because he's – No, hijack away, Jason. That's why <laughs> you're here. It's so I can take a break once in a while. <laughs> All right. Well, Larry, why? what has been the problem inside of the Libertarian Party then for the last 40 years that we haven't already, there, there hasn't already been this base of support that has been built? I, I happen to agree with you. I think if, if the Libertarian Party has a chance of survival and being relevant at any time in the future, it is attacking and building a framework and a foundation at the local level. But it would, it would seem as though it's been 40 years and this is still something that is, that, that hasn't happened. Happened yet, and what is is there just not a is it, are we are they just coming around now to figuring out that grassroots really pays, or is there something deeper at the Libertarian Party that's broken? I'm not even sure they figured it out yet. I may be the only guy. 
I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure they figured it out. And I'm the one crossing the country. I, I haven't seen a plan from anybody else. Maybe there is one. I'm not saying there isn't one. I'm saying I haven't seen another seven-year plan for anybody else. Well, here's the I thing. Know I know – I know from talking to people inside the Libertarian Party that there really is not a good the the national the national party does a, a really poor job of communicating and organizing the the other in and, and this the other states and providing them support both financial and and just organizational structured support so that they can do what they need to do and it, it just seems to me i frankly i've I'm been very very critical of the libertarian party and but there are very good people who are trying to do good work in there it's just there's not enough of them to get over the hurdle of all of the uh, all the clowns that don't have a clue what they're doing Doing and and who are constantly coming out and putting their foot in their mouth and or or doing something just just ridiculous like like nominating our our most recent uh, presidential and vice presidential candidates. I I don't know what to think of the Libertarian Party anymore, but everything I see makes me want to distance myself from them. Well, here's what I would say: if you look at a, a certain aspect of it, I think you will. There is hope, and there are several reasons why. Every place I've gone in the past, as I said, seven different conventions, I hear the same thing. One, victories at the lower level. We hadn't had that before. Two, the largest conventions they've ever had, and this is an off year. We didn't have that before. Three, the youth is finally showing up. It's not just a bunch of guys with white hair. They're there still, there too, and I want them there. But in addition, it is people who are you know, 18, 19, 20 years old showing up also. People who are 30-something, 20-something, they're now showing up. So that gives me great hope. The second well, that gives me great hope is, um, as a general rule, you know, the, when I bring my message out, generally speaking, people are angry at me. There are some exceptions to that rule, but as a general rule, they're not. They're, they're not happy with your messaging? Is that what no, you're saying? No, not angry at me. Oh, okay. They're okay. Well, that's good. Yes, it's a I, general rule. That's not a hundred percent, but a good general rule. I look at it. And I mean, it's great that we got young people who are coming out and being excited about it. But, but uh, you know, Bernie Sanders proved that the youth vote does not convert. Um, what we need is middle class voting Americans who are recognizing that change has to happen and realizing that neither of the two controlling political parties are going to do any kind of change, not the kind of change that they want. And then they have to turn towards the Libertarian Party and they have to see an organization that is professional, that is well managed, that has strong grassroots, uh, the strong grassroots organization that so that they feel confident stepping in and, and voting for for a candidate, even if they know that, uh, you know, there's, there's not a chance that Gary Johnson is going to be elected. If they see some opportunities for Further down the ballot to do what you're talking about, then you might just get them to vote an L instead of a Republican or a Democrat. Jeez, but it's got to start somewhere, and I'm telling you, it's starting now. That's all I'm what? telling you. You're right. What? It's got to start somewhere. I'm saying today. Well, I, I I I pray that you're right. I pray that you're right, I, and and I I hope that in 2018 um, we see things improve. But uh, you know that's I, and and listen, like I said, there there are really good people like you who are trying to do it right, and I appreciate the hard work that you're doing inside of uh, inside of a party that I think is fundamentally broken, and they ought to be listening to guys like you uh, a whole lot more than whoever they're taking advice from now. Jason, when you say the party is, is fundamentally broken. Is that is that a difficult thing to to fully assess when we're especially not I mean when we're talking about any group it's hard to assess because you always have different individuals coming in and coming out but is it even more difficult when we're talking about a bunch of libertarians a bunch of people that for whatever reason see themselves as maybe more individualist maybe as wanting to feel more outside the mainstream does that make kind of co coalescing that sort of person under one political party banner does that just make that very difficult and almost make it to the point well where you're gonna have of what you might see as as people sticking their foot in their mouths or that sort of thing, just because almost philosophically we almost encourage that. We almost encourage just just thinking differently and thinking outside the box and and saying things you're not supposed to say. 
Yeah, you know, it, uh, the biggest problem for for me when I when I say it's fundamentally broken, I mean there is no message and there is no command structure that allows for the building of a movement, right? So those are the two things that are broken right now. You have a national headquarters or a national libertarian party that doesn't do a good job of coordinating and uh, both coordinating and financing the 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 more grassroots, the state and local level elections. They have been focused mainly on ballot access, which after after 40 years, it's about time, um, and uh, and and other issues. But they have not been focused on doing what Larry clearly recognizes is the only approach to winning. And so you have that piece that's broken. And then you also have something going on inside the party that I don't fully understand, because you do have a group of, of anarchists and, and hardcore anti-government folks that are in there who are, who are, you know, frankly, way outside of what any, anyone would consider to be, in, in mainstream, would consider to be an acceptable political philosophy. Now, that doesn't mean it's not. It just means when you take the message out, the message is not going to resonate because it's too many jumps. They have to go to, through too many hoops to get to where the anarchists are at. And maybe in 50 years, we'll be close enough that that jump is a little bit shorter. But where we sit right now, it's just there's too much movement that has to occur philosophically for them to get there. Well, and so you yeah. have that wing, but then you have another problem because then you have the group that elected um, or that nominated uh, Gary Johnson. And Bill Weld, and you say, and I'm I'm watching at the convention, and I'm trying to figure out. Well, okay, I got you got two groups of people that appear to be polar opposites of each other. We, we claim to be all about individualism, and we claim to be like we're going to go against the crowd, and we don't want government, and government stinks. And then we nominate Gary Johnson, and so I'm looking at it and going, listen, I don't understand what's going on inside of it, but it does it it, it sh if it doesn't make sense to me, and I'm trying to figure it out then it doesn't make sense to anybody else and if nobody else can wrap their head around it if you if the if the average joe who's paying paying attention to politics from uh, you know, from september to november in an election year he sure isn't going to get it and so there we have the, the libertarian party's got to figure out who it wants to be and then it has to organize itself in a way that it can actually affect some change well look let me cover all three of those pieces the first one is the national level the what I'm trying to do here, and I, you're right. I'm agreeing with you completely. The national level has has been hasn't done as good as they could have done. I agree, and they don't listen to me as much as they could listen. I also agree. Of course, I'm I'm clearly biased at that one, <laughs> but but in any case, um, I'm going to the local levels and the state parties. Some of them are really organizing well. If you I don't know if you're paying attention, but some are beginning to organize much better, run much better, grow much stronger. What does that mean? The National uh, Party will either look at some of the states and go, wow, they're doing it right. Let's copy that. If they don't, then there will eventually be a coup, 2018, 2020, 2022, where one of the state parties or the, the ones who are successful will say, if you won't do it, we will, and they will begin to take over. One of those two things will happen either way. But with that in mind, I know there is a, uh, a side that says, look, we have to become mainstream quickly. I disagree with that. I don't want this comp this party to become Republican light or Democrat light. I think that's a mistake, which is one reason why I don't want the heavy hitters coming over right now. That's why I want us to build our own culture right now. If we build our own culture, we'll be OK. But the problem is the anarchist side, as you mentioned, they're so far away from the mainstream. They're going to get smaller. They're feeling it already. And they're starting to feel like they're not part of the party. They're already feeling that. And it's a valid fear because that's what's happening. They're going to be smaller and smaller. But if we don't keep them in our world, if we dismiss them, and if we grow too fast, we might dismiss them as a party. If we do that, we're not going to be a libertarian party. We're going to be Republican light or Democrat light. If we keep them in our world and use them as our beacon, use them as where we're supposed to be going towards, as you said, the 50-year plan where all of a sudden we get to that voluntary society. If we do that, we will keep our soul and we will have a real party that will be, be different. And the last piece I'll bring on is Gary Johnson. I'm still a Gary Johnson fan. He brought me into the party. I can't diss him. Sorry. Bill Well, different story. <laughs> Gary Johnson, I can't diss him. Sorry. Well, that's the interesting thing about Gary Johnson because, you know, Jason, I know you were very critical of Gary Johnson. We were fairly critical of him as well. We tried to be fair, but there was just a lot of ammo out there to be critical of. Uh, but when I look back, even on this last uh, three or four months of the election cycle, we got a lot of new people coming into the podcast. We got a lot of new people coming into our Lions of Liberty forum. 
And uh, uh, many of those people said they hadn't heard about these ideas until they heard that there's this guy, Gary Johnson. Now, that might be as far as Gary Johnson got them. <laughs> the fact that there was a guy named Gary Johnson, because, I mean, months later, they were they were you know spouting a lot of the same criticisms we were so it didn't take them long to sort of get more acclimated to the ideas even after they were first presented with someone who maybe wasn't the best speaker of those ideas so uh, jason i'm curious if, if from sort of a, a big picture marketing standpoint you're you're really big on, on marketing and that's really your wheelhouse do you see any sort of um, efficacy to the idea of having maybe a figurehead of the movement who we all kind of agree uh, isn't necessarily going to be pure, and I'm not suggesting that necessarily be Gary Johnson. It could be almost anybody, anybody with charisma, anybody who's able to get attention, anybody who's able to sort of vaguely speak on these ideas just to sort of get people interested. Or And how do you balance that with actually putting out a 100%? Obviously, that's nearly impossible because no one agrees on what that is, but as close to a pure message as possible. Well, no, I, I think it's critical that you have someone who represents who you are and that does a good job of it. You know, for long, Paul, a uh, long time, it was, uh, it was Ron Paul and Ron Paul was my, by no means an, a, an anarchist or a purist in terms in that standard, but, it, but he represented the ideas of Liberty and he was in Congress and he was in a place where, uh, where he could, he could at least have an impact. And he could be the guy who was demonstrating how those of us who believe in limited government, individualism, peace, tolerance, and free markets are supposed to act, and how we should conduct ourselves if we choose to engage in the political process. Uh, and so I, I do think there's an important there's an importance beyond that. If you want to talk just about the optics of it and, and the marketing piece of it, uh, it, I'll give you an example. If you go to a if you go to any type of uh, like charity event where they're trying to raise money for kids, uh, say orphans or for the you know. The, the starving kids in Ethiopia or something like that, you will notice that they will almost always trot out specific cases. You you also see this in politics when the politicians do a worse, do a terrible job of it because they don't really understand what they're supposed to be doing. But they'll stand up and they'll say, and I talked with Susie. She's a homemaker <laughs> in New Jersey. And she was telling me about her son who has, you know, emphysema. And what they're doing is, is they're attaching a face, a specific a person rather than a group because they know that you sell uh, you you raise a whole lot money for a whole lot more money for charity and you build a whole lot more emotional support for whatever your whatever your thing it is that you're peddling if you use specific people so by having someone to point to and go, that's our guy, that's our demigod, for lack of a better term, that's the guy who represents who we are and what we're about, if that person does a good job, it, it, can, it can yield you benefits a hundredfold. If they do a bad job of it, then you get Gary Johnson. Because what happened with Gary was Gary came out and people were already predisposed to the message because nobody really liked Trump. Nobody wanted Hillary. And so they were already looking. And so they turn and they find Gary Johnson, and this is kind of their first exposure to what it is that we do. And then they listen to Gary Johnson a little bit, and they're like, ah, some of that's making sense. And then he starts saying some of the Aleppo comments and a couple of these other things that just spitball or that just uh, you know balloon into a massive problem and and really a lot of negative press. So you took somebody who potentially had the opportunity to grow the party by uh, by a massive number and what you got was a bunch of people who turned to look our way and then immediately went ah I don't know he's a little crazy well yeah but I think that that kind of thing I mean look the the advantage we have the way we do our VP and presidential uh, slots means we can do a mix we can do someone who is you know a popular person who isn't the best with someone who maybe is better. I mean, that was my whole reason for running. I would have been happy to be Gary Johnson's vice president. I would have been happy to do that. I would have been happy well, to you be that done guy. Well, you would have done a heck of a lot better than... Yes, very sure. I think that's. I think one thing we everyone on the show can agree on is that we we would much rather have you or almost anybody than what we had with Bill Weld. Well, at yeah. the same time, I would have been happy to be you know McAfee's VP or Daryl Perry's VP or Austin Peterson's VP. The point is, someone has to be able to get out there and pass the message out in the way that people can get it. And if one person screws up, they need an attack dog to defend them. And we didn't have that. You know, when we our advantage is if we throw someone out there. 
We need to have someone out there. One of my pitches at the convention was, who do you want attacking Donald Trump? Me, another New Yorker who doesn't mind getting in a street fight with him? Or do you want Gary to try to fight him? I don't want Gary fighting Donald Trump. Let me fight him. That was, one, that was my pitch. So I think we can have uh, – I'm not saying we should have Gary Johnson again. I'm not at all saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is if we don't have the right person as the president, we can then have the right one as a vice president. Look, the odds of us winning the presidency in the next you know, couple years is slim. Could happen. Don't get me wrong. It could happen. But the odds are slim. We need people who can push the message more than anything else and get attention more than anybody else. This is the critical aspect today. No, I agree. I agree with everything you said, Larry. I, I think that, I think you're right. I think that you've, you you got to have some you got to have some people in if they're if they're going to represent the Libertarian Party, you got to have some people in there who do a good job of representing who really understand philosophically what libertarians believe and then can articulate that message in a way that attracts new people, at least gets them interested, at least piques their interest. Along with someone who just gets attention. You know, look, I don't think McAfee was the best guy we could have had up there, but man, would he have brought attention. If we had the right VP, that could have actually worked just as well. Right? The right, the right, the right attack dog behind him or the right guy who then would do damage control in the case of in the case of McAfee might have been damage control. But the right person to do damage control still could have made this an overall huge win. Look, last year was not great. I, I got that, but it was still good. We still got a lot more people to hear about us, and because of last year, we will probably get a lot of good press in 2020. So there were some good aspects to last year, even though clearly it could have been better. I'm curious, Larry, what you think, what kind of lessons that people within the Libertarian Party, longtime activists, and people that are, are currently on uh, the Libertarian National Committee, what sort of lessons are they going to take from this past election cycle in 2016? Because on the one hand, if you just look at numbers, if you just look at metrics, I don't think anybody can argue that it's definitely the best election cycle the Libertarian Party has ever had by yep. a wide margin, by leaps and yes. bounds. I mean, the vote totals, I think, were over three times the highest that anybody had ever ever gotten before. Uh, at the same time, they're getting the name Libertarian was out there in the press a lot. But there's the flip side to that, which Jason has talked about not only on today's show, but for months and months on end, that when they did tune in, what they got was Gary Johnson sticking his tongue out and Bill Weld endorsing Hillary Clinton. Now, I don't want to spend the whole show harping on Gary and Bill. We've all done that uh, in, in our own ways to to great lengths. But how do you sort of find that balance? I mean, where... On the one hand, you want that attention. You want that mainstream attention that having the, quote, two governors brought you. And and maybe it's great that if, if a lot of money comes in along with that. Well, you're asking two things. You're saying what will they and then what should they? Will, I don't know anything to right. be forward. I don't know. I have no. I don't know if anyone's learned any lessons to be forward. I don't know. So what, what should they learn then? Let's go with that. Yes, there we go. Here's, here's what I've learned. The first thing is even though there were some terrible people who um, – terrible things people saw when they tuned in, they tuned in. And they'll tune in again because they're waiting for the next Aleppo moment. They're waiting for it. They can't wait. And they're going to tune in and hope someone does Aleppo again. <laughs> and we're going to hopefully have someone who doesn't do Aleppo. So we'll be fine. We will then wow them. The next thing is – this, and there is an advantage. that There is a silver lining here. The bar is now pretty low. So you know, if we get up there and do something decent, we can actually gain some traction. They'll be like, wow, these guys are way better. They're more exciting. They're more this. They're more that. They're more savvy. So we do have an advantage you know, from last year that we can use now. What we should be learning is a couple of things. The first thing is we want to start as early as possible. We started too late. We should be starting earlier. As soon as – one of the reasons – some people don't know this. The day I lost, that night, I raised money for the party and for the ticket. I raised six figures that night at, at an event. On the day of the vice presidential vote? That's correct. Right, right afterwards, you went right out to fundraising. Yes, I, I went to my hotel That's room amazing. to do a quick nap because I was exhausted. <laughs> I then got back up. I emceed the fundraiser uh, along with, Nick's, with uh, Nick, the, uh, the chair, together. I don't want to just take all the credit. He was there also, absolutely. And we did a fundraiser, and we raised six figures. I, th I think 130 k I think. I don't remember, but it was a bunch of money. And I did it on purpose because I wanted us to start out strong. We have to remember that next time, we need to be starting strong immediately the second that we're done into the press action ready to go that's number one. Second thing we have to do joint events with down ticket 
it looked like Gary Johnson was the only guy running. He was our savior. There was no one else. But there was lots of people. I, I was on TV a couple of times. And when I was on TV, I always said, oh, and let's not forget Lily Tang Williams, who's running in Colorado. Alex Merced, who's running in New York. That we did not do well. And I hope we learned the lesson. We have to look like a bigger party, a real party, and mention everyone else who's running. When we do an event, it should be full of everyone who's running. We should have our, our Senate candidates there, our gubernatorial candidates there, our local candidates there. It should be a Libertarian Party event. This, we, we dropped the ball on that last year. And I hope they see it next time. Now, that really is a, a huge missed opportunity because, I mean, can you imagine, especially when you have such great stories in the Libertarian Party? I mean, Lily yes. Tang Williams, who you just Amazing. mentioned, incredible story. I mean, yep. if, I, if I'm Gary Johnson, I'm mentioning her on every campaign stop. I'm going to say, I did. and look at our Senate candidate, Lily Tang Williams, her incredible story coming from communist China over here. So do you think that, it, it, I mean, you just said it, but I mean, Jason, what do you think about that approach? And that, or do you think that the Libertarian Party and looking at it as, as sort of a vehicle like this is, is, do you think it's a lost cause? Or do you think it really is a matter of what Larry is saying of really just altering this approach? Well, nothing's a lost cause if you can do the things that Larry's talking about doing. The problem is the the Libertarian Party's shown itself to be completely inept. So, I, I mean, Larry's saying all the right things. That's exactly what you want out of a party. That's good marketing strategy. It's a it's an excellent plan that you, he's laid out. It's just uh, unless I'm mistaken, Larry doesn't get to make any decisions inside the LP. So, uh, I mean, he can tell them what they need to do. But unless you get some of those yahoos at the top to decide to actually do it and reorientate themselves, then it's it's not going to work. So, I, listen, I don't want to be the naysayer. That wasn't ever my objective. I like I said, I I would love it if we had a liberty voice and and a libertarian party that I could associate I could associate myself with. But I it's gotten to the point now where I don't want my brand mixing with their brand because I got to make too many caveats every time I have a conversation. Um, yeah. And, and so yeah, a I, lot, I a lot of damage control required. It's true. Yeah, and and so I, I'm looking at it and saying, man, man, if if Larry can get half of that done in in 2018, 2020, then then man, they, they might be able to make a comeback. But it's going to take some radical change in in the way that they operate to get that done. So, Jason, I am I am accepting that as if I get this done by 2020, you will join the party and endorse. That's what I'm accepting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I, uh, listen, if 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 you end up getting it done and and you run in 2020 and uh, and and it, and it looks good, and then uh, man, I, I I'll, I'll I'll endorse an individual over a party. Um, I I follow people, not parties, so it's it's principle that I'm concerned okay. with. I like it. Gentlemen, this has been a great talk, and we're not quite done yet, but I do need to take a quick break to give a word to today's sponsor. I firmly believe one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself and your loved ones is to own a firearm. But for a lot of people, buying a gun can be an overwhelming process. There are just so many options, and not everyone feels comfortable walking into a gun store. Well, our friends at MartinArmory.com are doing their part to change that. Martin Armory was founded with a simple goal, to make buying a gun simple and affordable. Instead of carrying thousands of different guns, MartinArmory.com only carries 25. This allows them to focus on providing the most popular guns on the market at insanely cheap prices. And now for a limited time, their prices are even more insane as MartinArmory.com is offering Lions of Liberty listeners free shipping. Simply go to MartinArmory.com, pick an awesome gun, and enter the promo code LIONS. Again, that's MartinArmory.com. The promo code is LIONS. Let's talk about one more thing here that you guys both kind of mentioned, and that's damage control. <laughs> and there's there's really something, I mean, obviously we all know about the Arvin Vora uh, issue. You guys have both talked about it in length. That's no secret. Uh, he had some comments to say that a lot of people that were in the military really, I don't, I don't want to say took the wrong way. I mean, they took it as, as it was stated. Uh, we don't need to go over that whole specific incident because I really want Please, to talk. No. Yeah, I know Larry has been deep, deep, knee deep in it. But uh, yes. what I really do want to talk about is the overall messaging and what we can learn from that, though, because I think when dealing with um, the police, 
case, when dealing with the military, a lot of libertarians really do have a problem because, and it's not from nowhere. I mean, we see the war on drugs. We see all the horrible things that a lot of police officers do participate in. And it, there's kind of a synapse, I think, that occurs within the libertarian mind where we immediately, you know, we'll, we'll see war on, we'll see the war on drugs. We'll see a SWAT raid. Suddenly we have to see every cop as those people carrying out the SWAT raids. Uh, and the same kind of thing kind of happens with the military. Um, we're appalled at a lot of the aggressive wars. We're appalled when we see civilians killed, when we see a hospital bombed, all things that any rational human should absolutely be appalled by. But then there's the leap where suddenly we want to call everyone that's ever been associated with the military and put them on the same footing of being equally immoral or equally evil. Uh, how do we address these issues? Because, uh, you know, th- I see a lot of people out there, especially with the Arvin Vora, there's kind of two sides there's been to this. There's been, no, he shouldn't have said this. He should take it back. Um, he, sh- he should just really apologize and we should put out a different message or a different approach to the message, I should say. There's the other side that says, let me just c- kind of put that other, the other side out there because I've seen this a lot too, though. Um, Rhymes with wussy. Uh, li- a lot of people will say that libertarians are becoming wussies about this. If you're if you're trying to sort of corral people like Arvin Vora who see themselves as, as speaking truth to power and speaking strongly, so how do you find this balance between between speaking the truth, calling out actual evils? I mean, the war on drugs, patently evil. We should call it that. Uh, aggressive wars, bombing hospitals, killing civilians, patently evil. But how do we uh, so sort of portray that message without alienating the millions and millions and millions? Millions of people who are not only in those organizations, but once they come around to our, our ideas, and I've seen this with, with past guests on the show, both of you guys are ex-military. So, I mean, the evidence is right here in front of us, who could be some of the best absolute allies that we have. Uh, Larry, I'll let you start, just since you've been personally dealing with this so much lately. Yeah, look, the thing to remember is it's not black and white. You can tell the truth without being a jerk. You don't have to be a jerk to tell the truth. Right. I, when when my when my mother died, the guy could have said to me, hey, that chick who bore you. Yeah, she's dead. She'll be in the ground in like three days to get over it. And that would have been an accurate statement. That would have been honest. But why say that? He's just being a jerk. And there'd be nothing noble about it. There'd be nothing noble yes. about him speaking truth to power just because he was that, a jerk about it. <laughs> yes. He could just say your mother passed. You know, um, at least she's not suffering anymore. In both cases, it's true. In both cases, my mother doesn't come back to life. In both cases, I'm still sad. But in case two, I'm not mad at the messenger. In case one, I am. Let's realize being mad at the messenger matters if you want people to vote for you. If he wants me to go back to the hospital, he probably should be nice to me. I'll go back to the hospital. I want people to vote for me. That's step one. But step two is... It doesn't work. We did this after Vietnam. Now, I was in Marine Corps, but earlier than Jason. I was in the 80s. And most of my leadership was Viet- were Vietnam vets. So my gunnery sergeants and my staff sergeants, my tops, they were all, they were all the Vietnam vets. Not all, but most were. So what we learned from Vietnam is when they come home and you call them baby killers, it doesn't help. It doesn't make the military industrial complex go away. It doesn't stop imperial wars. But more importantly, it alienates an entire generation of veterans. Why in the world would you do that? It doesn't work. And the last piece, which is, if you're so high and mighty about them being murderers, how about realize that if they're out there pulling a trigger, you're writing the checks and buying the guns. You're paying taxes. You're voting. You're part of this too. We're all dirty. Every single one of us is dirty. Let's step up. And stop worrying about pointing our finger, and instead, let's instead of calling people murderers, let's stop the murder. If we get elected, we can stop the murder. I want to stop the murder. Well, Larry's just a dirty tool of the state. I am. That's sure. the pro- <laughs> you know. Listen, I I talked about this on my show, and and uh, I've I've been I've been downrange, and uh, I've I've never knowingly uh, killed any innocent people. Uh, I came close a couple of times, but I was lucky enough to to not have to engage. And it's th- those are the types of things that that keep you up at night. I the, the the people. There's a difference between being upset 
at what you are using the military for. And this is the, because I talk about this all the time on my show, I point out all of the atrocities that are being committed by our government using the military as its tool. But I, I look at those who are in the military because I was in the military. And, and I think some people who've never been in it, and, and Larry can attest to this, the people who are there are very patriotic people. They're, they're there because they yes. believe in freedom. They believe in, in liberty. That, that's, that's largely the tool the state uses to sell these guys on joining, is that you're going to be protecting freedom and democracy and liberty. And, and we need you. And we, we want you on that wall. We need you on that wall. That, that kind of idea. Idea is how is how young men end up joining the military. Yeah, I, I didn't do it for the college money. Frankly, I didn't even want to go to school. I did it because I was deeply passionate about those ideas. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I showed up in Iraq and, and put my feet in the sand and started looking around and realized, man, all that stuff they told me, that's a load of crap. We're not here doing any of that stuff. And that's when things start to shift. So a great many of the military men who are in right now, who were hoodwinked as teenagers, 18, 19 years old, into joining the military, are now there realizing that they were wrong because ignorance and youth oftentimes come together. And they're waking up. And when they turn to look for someone, an ideology, a, 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 a group that's going to help them make the transition, they're staring at this clown in the Libertarian Party who calls them killers and murderers. That's the kind of crap that I don't care who you are, you're just a moron. It's just I don't care if you really believe that. Shut up if you're going to be a party official and and do something that's actually going to help advance the cause and bring some of these people in who are making that mental shift, making that change. Not everybody is as aware, is as awake, if you want to, if you want to use that term, as the three of us having this conversation. There are a lot of people that it's it's still taking some time, but as long as they're open, I, I'm like, I look at it like a crack in the wall, man. As long as that crack is there, it's only going to take the water. A, a, a certain amount of time before that dam gives way. And what you got to do is you got to look for that crack and then you got to do everything you can to exploit it, to help it along, to open that, to open that crack up so that you can start to let the truth in. And people, uh, when any time this happens, and it's just another example, in my opinion, of, of, of problems within, within the LP, that this type of thing continues to leak out. I, it just, it's, it's unfortunate because there's a huge support base for our ideology inside of the military. Agreed. I mean, the, what the Libertarian Party stands for is exactly why most people join the military. They Correct. wanted freedom. They wanted liberty. They wanted to support the, the, the Constitution, the freedoms that we have. That was the reason for many people that wanting to join in the first place. Then when they realize, wow, it's not that, when they leave, they still feel the same way. They yep. still want that completely. I totally I mean, agree. Think about, think about what a military man really does when he signs up. The USMC, you signed the MFing contract, right? <laughs> you, yes. you're, you are essentially giving up your liberty. You are saying – I will I will give up my right to live my life according to my will so that I can defend my neighbor's right to exercise that freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what you're saying when you join the military. It's incredible. They can send you to any godforsaken land, charge any hill for any reason, and if you refuse they will throw you in jail for the balance of your living uh, of your life. That's the way they operate. And there are men and women in this nation who are willing to do that, who are willing, I will go. When the time comes, I will go. And the unfortunate thing is, is that we have a government that then exploits those people and uses them for uh, intentions that they were never designed to be used for, all kinds of offensive conflicts and conflicts of uh, uh, capitalist pursuit things that really we shouldn't be involved in. But that's not, you know, to attack the service member is really to kick the wrong dog. So I just, it frustrates me when I, when I look at, the, at what these guys and men and women are really committing to, what the sacrifice that they have made of their own liberty and the reasons that 90% of them do it. 
And then to have somebody inside the LP refer to them as murderers um, and, and morally reprehensible is is shameful to me. And I know a lot of people that are in the military. I have a lot of friends that are, that are in the military family as well. And I can tell you one thing about people that are in the military. These are the people that you want on your side, <laughs> whether you're in the physical trenches or the political trenches or the philosophical trenches. These are all a bunch of tough MFers. Mentally, you have to be at least mentally tough to get through this as you guys all know. And these are the people you want to win over. You don't want to push away. And I think the person that probably did this better than anybody I've seen when it comes to that balance between speaking the truth, speaking truth to power, calling out moral evils, but not actually alienating the specific people involved is Ron Paul. I mean, that's what he did out there on, on that stage at the Republican, uh, Republican debates when he would call out our specific military policies. He would call out our interventions, but he never said a, a word about the troops except bring them home except i support the troops by bringing them home and i think we can all take an example from his approach from the approach of both of you uh when it when it comes to this and many other issues because as larry said earlier we are all a part of this system one way or another sure maybe some of us actually put on a uniform and even perhaps carry out atrocities under the government. But the rest of us have all been involved in other ways, whether it's paying our taxes. Hey, I, I could have protested and not paid my income taxes last year. I chose to do it. I chose to do it because I guess I just wasn't brave enough to hold out. But really, it's because I didn't want to go to jail. And we're all dealing with this balance in our personal lives of how we deal with our philosophy and how it relates to real life. But we need to figure out how to apply that same balance to the liberty movement and to messaging these ideas. Uh, before we sign off, I want to give each of you a moment to just speak on on this. Basically, the idea of if you were sort of uh, the president of liberty, a position that I just created that's not, not real in any way, but if you could basically direct multiple facets of the liberty movement, basically, if you were the totalitarian leader of the liberty movement, you could tell everybody, this is what we got to do for the next eight years. Uh, how would things play out in your in your perfect world? I know Larry sort of already has laid out his seven-year plan, so what do you think has to sort of actually entail, not just necessarily within the libertarian party, but within the libertarian movement as a whole, to really see liberty advance to to the greatest extent it, it reasonably could uh, in the next eight years or so. Uh, Larry, you've, you've sort of already touched on your seven-year plan, so I'll let you dig into that a little more, both how you see that playing out within the LP, but you know how, that, how you see that affecting the greater movement towards liberty in, in the United States, in the world. I, if I was a dictator of the planet or whatever you called it, a uh, libertarian <laughs> dictator, whatever, I wouldn't be a dictator. I don't believe it's the right way of leading. That's that's not post-industrial leadership. What I would do is I would make sure that I, I would give out – I would do what I'm doing now, which is I would let all the local state chapters begin to find their own goals. What do you guys want? If I, ha if I had any power to force, I would only force one thing. You have to give me a goal. But let the individual state pick its own goal. It's the individual affiliate pick its own goal. I would force the LNC to pick a goal. That's what I would say. Is the goal to you know grow the party to ten million people? Is the goal to um, you know uh, be a, a, a repository for all uh, um, uh, candidates throughout the country? Is the goal to elect a president, etc. Whatever that national goal would be. Each state. Is the goal to make a change to policy? Is the goal to get a certain number of people elected? Is the goal to grow the party to a certain number? Any of those goals are good goals. But once you have a goal, now you can then organize to that goal. And it must be at the state level. Right now, we are so accustomed to just losing and it not mattering, we don't have any goals. Our goal is just don't get worse. Just don't be a statist. Just don't be. Just don't be is not a goal. We have to actually have a goal. That's what the party's actually lacking. That's why I have a seven-year plan, and I think that's the answer. Local goals to motivate people to achieve those goals. That's libertarian. You know, The idea of libertarianism is not we do it all by ourselves. The idea is we create voluntary, temporary collectives to get it to achieve a goal, do something right. That's what a local party should be. We should all be on the same page to achieve a certain goal, and we volunteer. We want to do it, and we get what I love, and I say all the time, we get a diversity – of thought with unity of purpose. That is what every leader needs to get. Diversity of thought, unity of purpose. The problem is we don't have a purpose. We need that first. Jason, I know you're not going to shy away from being the dictator of liberty, are you? 
No, but well, obviously you're not gonna you're not gonna rely necessarily on the the party apparatus in your vision maybe as much. But what's the ideal scenario for the next eight years playing out, just in terms of advancing the ideas of liberty? Obviously, the Jason Stapleton show becoming the number one show in America would be the first one. But other than that. Well, let me just first say how much I appreciate um, what what guys like Larry are doing, and, and Larry personally, and and the efforts that he's making um, to try and to try and spread the message and and try and create a movement because that's we need a lot of people doing that in a lot of different areas, and uh, and it, he's it's a it's going to be an uphill battle all the way, and uh, it's it's good that that we have guys like him who are willing to fight it. I think if I my my goal, and it, it wouldn't change if I. If if I was in charge of everything and it wouldn't really change what I try and do. What I want to do is I want to amass as many people as humanly possible under the same, the same basic philosophical banner that, so that we can then direct that weapon wherever we want it to go. So my goal for the show has always been a large audience. So then I can direct that audience in activist activities when the time came. So maybe it's when uh, Connecticut decides that it wants everybody to register their guns. And so we put a call out and now people are coming in from every state uh, around Connecticut to stand outside on this courthouse steps or on the Capitol building lawn uh, with their weapons. Um, maybe it's something as simple as having a group of people who realize that there's a guy down the street who's about to have his garden tilled over because some, some local city ordinance says he can't grow a garden on his own property. And at that point, you've got 15 or 18 guys who show up or 50 guys who show up and say, oh, we don't think we're going to let you do that today. You know, I don't know what, I don't know how you, how you direct that army. But I know it can be put to positive use. It might be directing everybody to get out to the voting booths on Election Day and put more libertarians into office or libertarian-minded people into office. What I'm concerned with is making sure that the message resonates and that as many people as possible begin to see that message as, as acceptable. So when you talk about Ron Paul when he was running for president and he was talking about bringing the troops home and all of the uh, all of the military action that we were doing around the world and how how terrible it was and going as far as to say that hey some of what 911 was about was our military interventionist policy there is some blame that America has for what happened well that was a message that was that did did not resonate with the american people it resonated with a small group of this liberty minded people but they're very small over the years as the wars have drawn on, as things have uh, have continued the way they have, more and more people are waking up. And now when you have that conversation with them, now when I talk to people about uh, military intervention and the damage that it's causing with uh, whether you're a Democrat or you're Republican, some guys who are hardcore neocons are now coming to the, to the realization that, hey, there's some truth to what Ron Paul was saying. That only happens over time as you chip away against these old ideas. And and so for me, I know Larry has is, is tried to stay away from, I, from any sort of like philosophical ideology. I have really tried to, in, in a very broad sense, kind of wrap everybody under the tent the way Reagan said we're a big tent. I've kind of tried to do the same thing. I don't really care whether you're an anarchist. I don't care whether you're a constitutionalist, a minarchist. You name, you call yourself whatever you want to. You can call yourself a progressive if you want to. If you're making a decision to make a freer and uh, and, and 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 a freer society focused on individualism and free markets, then I, I'm going to support you. And I think the more that we do that and come together and cooperate with one another on things where we agree the farther we can go. But it only works if everybody understands the message and it's not um, it's a message that you don't get attacked for. That's what I think you ought to do if you really want to change the world. Well, Jason, Larry, I both appreciate you guys so much coming on this show and making an amazing episode 300 with me. But on a greater level, I really appreciate both of the work you guys are doing to spread the ideas of liberty. You both have different approaches to it, but I think you're both you know, your heart is in the correct place and you're both really doing a tremendous job in your own way. So thank you both so much for joining me for this 300th episode of Lions of Liberty. I really do appreciate it. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring, gentlemen.
And that goes for you guys, too. I want you out there roaring about the ideas of liberty. You know, that's that really is, at the end of the day, why we do this show. We do this show because we want to spread the ideas of liberty, but we also want to encourage others to do the same, whether it's starting your own podcast, uh, starting your own YouTube channel, writing libertarian-themed music or movies or plays or sock puppet plays, whatever you want, or whether it's just starting some conversations uh, with people at the bar or your family members or co-workers, which can be dangerous sometimes. But however you choose to participate and help spread the ideas of liberty, we're going to be here for you. We're going to continue to be here three days a week, at a minimum, more than that. If you're a member of the Lions of Liberty Pride, again, you can join that and get early access to all sorts of high-profile interviews like the one I did today with Jason Stapleton and Larry Sharp. I had Judd Weiss interview up there early, Sam Cedar. We also do a whole bunch of bonus content, including our Conspiracy Corner, where we talk about conspiracies, the kind of stuff that I don't really touch on too much on this podcast we really do a deep dive uh for the bonus crew and of course we do bonus roundtables and a lot of other stuff we've got planned down the pike for as little as five bucks a month guys that's all it takes and of course we have a few higher tiers 10 bucks 25 bucks where you can get some free t-shirts essentially get basically a month or two for free because we pay you back with the the, the free t-shirt so that's really an easy way to basically give yourself a sample if you know you're going to want to buy a t-shirt anyway but otherwise if you if you do want to buy t-shirts if you're already a member of the pride and you want an even greater bonus than you currently get because pride members do get a discount we're offering a discount like I said at the top of the show that is just unprecedented only through this Friday at midnight it's Discount code LIONS300. Again, you can find all our merchandise over at lionsofliberty.store. So be sure to check that out as well. Or just go ahead and join the Pride and get some free gear. Go to lionsofliberty.com slash support to check that out. Now, I know it's been a long show, guys, but there's something really, really important that I want to update you on before we sign off here. And that is, of course, the work that our friends at DonorC are doing. Uh, of course, I interviewed Greg Glyer a few months ago. I'll post my interview with him over at the show notes for this page at lionsofliberty.com slash 300. And uh, he created an amazing app called DonorC, which allows people to directly give to charitable projects. And uh, we have been working for the last month or so in conjunction with uh, several other podcasts, our friends of ours, the Johnny Rocket Launch Lava Flow Podcast, We Are Libertarians, all sorts of other groups to sort of try to come together and contribute to a specific project every month. Last month, we contributed to Esther's project, and we got it fully funded. My goal was to have it funded by episode 300, and we did it, guys. And many of my listeners out there are the ones that contributed, so I'm so proud of you guys for that. Esther now has her HIV medication funded for an entire year. She also now has a job at a chicken farm, and as a result of that, she's actually able to help raise some of the orphans on that farm. So it really is a win-win, a great project. And now we've got another one that we're sponsoring, and it is a huge one. This project was posted by Gret Glyer, the founder of Donor C himself. And what they're doing is building a well in this village, Chingaluma Village in Malawi. About 300 families live there, and currently they have to walk 45 minutes each way to get their water from a dirty swamp. People die every year because of diseases they get from drinking this filthy water. Water, but it's their only option. So what they're going to do is install a high quality well right in the middle of the village so they don't have to do that walk anymore and the water will be 100% clean. It'll be closed. It's going to dramatically change the lives of 300 families, not just 300 people, 300 families. The well should last for 20 years. So for the amount of money they're raising, it comes out to around a buck 48 to uh, for a family to get them clean water for a whole year. I mean, that that's great value for your money. So I really want to encourage you to donate anything at all, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever you got, anything will help. Every single little bit helps. You can do this by downloading the DonorC app or going to DonorC.com and you can either search for uh, Gret Glyer, you can search for Mark Clare because I've, I've donated to that project so it'll appear on my page as well and we will also link to this project and more information about it over at the show notes for today's show again over at lionsofliberty.com slash 300. You can also search Facebook for the group Walk the Walk. That's the Facebook group started by a fan of this program and member of the Lions of Liberty Pride, Clint Rankin, and he started this group to kind of focus people in the Liberty community onto these specific projects every month. So go find Walk the Walk or find the website walkthewalktofreedom.com. Guys and gals, thank you so much for being here with me on this journey, and it truly has been a journey. If you go back and listen to episode one, which you can find over at lionsofliberty.com slash podcast, where I have 
all of the back episodes of the show, you will see that the show has progressed quite a bit from those very early days when I really had no idea what I was doing, as opposed to now when I have some small idea of what I'm doing. And it's always a learning process, and I appreciate all the feedback and input from you guys, because you guys are not only helpful in in how we shape and craft this show, but you really are the inspiration, because I do this to change hearts and minds, and when I see people getting excited about liberty because of things we're doing on this show, I mean, that's what drives me to keep sitting in front of this microphone and bringing you these episodes. And I know the same goes for Brian, the same goes for John. That's why we can continue to think of new things we can do, uh, new segments we can produce for you guys, and, and new ways to keep this conversation going because at the end of the day it's about not not just changing political ideas and it is but it's also about changing the culture and in many ways that is what comes first that's what we focus on that's what we want you to help us focus on out there in liberty land if you enjoy the work we do guys please share the show tell your friends tell your family hit that subscribe button on itunes on stitcher wherever you listen to the show and of course while you're there why don't you leave us a great review and a five-star rating it's the easiest way to help us out until next time folks you're darn tootin'. You're gonna live long and live free. <laughs>